Mr Desmond, thank you very much for coming in to talk to us about your new role on the International Trade Select Committee. Um, can I start by asking why you chose to seek election to this new body? Well, it is a, a new body, um, a fresh start after um, uh, years in ministerial office. Uh, secondly, I'm particularly interested in international trade, irrespective of the newness of the Brexit situation. Uh, I've been Minister for International Development for the last couple of years. Trade dwarfs aid. It's vitally important for the least developed countries. So there's a wider agenda, but clearly uh, we are going to have to make our way in the world and no one owes us a living and trade and free trade particularly is going to be vitally important to us. Mm. What do you think the committee's first priority in its work should be? Well, I think, first of all, we've got to get to grips with what the different possibilities are and the limitations and all the rest. You know, but what does it mean being part or not part of the customs union and or part or the extent to which you're part of the free the um the single market you know these these are different things there are a whole series of different possibilities um there's the Liechtenstein model the iceland model the norwegian model the swiss model or some model moving in elliptical orbit around them all um how do you think you can best use your role on the select committee on the select committee sorry to hold the government to account on what it's doing in international trade? Well, first of all, by asking questions uh, and finding out what the answers are. But that will involve not just ministers. You know, remember, the select committee will um, have any number of witnesses come before it and experts. Uh, and exposing that adds to the debate. And I, I firmly believe that we should be having a debate holding the government to account I believe that, you know, the reality is that the government has got to get on and negotiate, as it says, the best possible deal. Uh, and so long as it has the confidence of the House of Commons, that's the constitutional position that it should go out and do it, in my view, under the royal prerogative. Of course, Parliament wants to influence the process and understand the process, and that's what Select Committee and debates are for. I reject, however, the notion that it's our job to vote on the process and shape it in that particular way, because mm. that will bind the government's hands and deliver the worst possible deal. Mm. We've touched there on the use of the prerogative powers and what Parliament's role should be. The government's stated position is that it won't offer what it calls a running commentary on the Brexit process. How do you believe that view is compatible with parliamentary scrutiny? Well, I think it's, it's compatible in that Parliament will debate different possibilities and ask ministers about different possibilities. That, is, that shapes the mind of ministers and conditions the debate. You know, uh, you know, we are influencing ministers. Ministers are members of Parliament as well and are influenced and participate in those debates. But I do not expect a running commentary on the, what the government's objectives are in negotiation and how it's going. Hmm. Is it possible to have free trade without freedom of movement? Because the government's stated aim is to have free trade where possible. But the question about controls over migration and then to be raised questions about whether or not particularly a trade deal with the European Union would come with that precondition of allowing freedom of movement from people from the continent into this country and of course vice versa. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but it's too soon to tell. <laughs> the, the reality is, let me, let me uh, be honest with you, I have been campaigning to leave the EU since 1975 when I voted against joining the common market. But actually, the one thing I actually liked about the EU was freedom of movement. But nevertheless, clearly, uh, we have to take account of the very strong steer that we have had from the electorate on immigration. So it's a question of what we, we can negotiate as to the extent to which we can be members of or have access to the single market and the extent to which freedom of movement is curtailed on allow or allowed to achieve that. Now, it might be that they take a political 
position and say, well, look, sorry, the rule is uh, that if you're a member of the single market, you have to allow freedom of movement on exactly the same basis which we do now. But there's a lot of negotiating before we get to that position and then, you know, see what else might be available, what, what movement could be made on both sides. We're at the start of what's going to be quite a long process of scrutiny, negotiation, examination. Given that the committee discussed its reporting priorities the other week, are there any individuals or groups that you're particularly keen to hear from as the deliberations move forward? Uh, yes, undoubtedly. Um, uh, I, I certainly want to start with the World Trade Organization. Um, we will want to speak to people in Brussels, get a feel for, uh, uh, of the way they see it. But equally, I'm also interested in academics and the universities uh, and those who've done a lot of work on trade. Are there any sectors of the economy that the government should seek to prioritise in laying the groundwork and then setting out on free trade deals after Article 50 is completed? This is where I start to run into my own ideological um, prejudices. Um, uh, <clears throat> now, I, I, on the whole, governments of any colour don't do things well. And therefore, the less we expect them to do, the better. And I'm therefore nervous of industrial uh, and economic strategies. Um, I believe in free markets and a measure of laissez-faire. Uh, and I don't believe in picking winners because rarely do you pick the right ones. Mm. I think that, uh, and equally, when it comes to this whole notion of trade agreements, it, nations don't trade with one another. Individuals and companies do. And, you know, we don't have trading agreements with many of the countries that we trade very, very successfully with because individuals and companies do that. And I'm always nervous of a trade deal which is a stitch up on behalf of some producer interest to accommodate a particular industry um, for whatever reasons the government has chosen to prioritize those industries. So certainly I have no view that there are certain industries that are, should be prioritized. Clearly, there are problems that stand out immediately, like the whole question of passporting and the extent to which we've got to deliver that. And after all, if the financial services deliver 10% of our tax revenue, that's clearly going to be high on the government's mind that it won't want to see any diminution in the, um, the productivity of that industry. How? Let's move away from international trade for a second and return to the role of Parliament in the Brexit process. Last week, the High Court ruled that parliamentary approval should be sought in response to triggering Article 50. You've stated there that you believe it is a prerogative power issue. It's a view that's shared by the government. How do you believe they should be responding to last week's ruling and what do you see as right. the way forward in that? When I said a, a, the government negotiates using the prerogative powers and then comes to Parliament subsequently to ratify treaties, that's the way we've negotiated all the EU treaties hitherto, it's not for me to say whether the government can or cannot initiate the process on the basis of prerogative power, given the judgment that's already taken place. I'd say it depends what the remedy to the judgment is. Of course, the, the, the court is entirely uh, legitimate in ruling on a point of law, and I, I don't complain about that. Um, I think there are grounds for appeal, uh, but nevertheless, so the first remedy is the government wins its appeal and we carry on as before. The second possibility, the government loses the appeal, but it is judged that a resolution of both houses is sufficient. Now, in that case, I think it would be relatively straightforward to gain a resolution of both houses. It might be a bit messier in the Lords, but it's certainly, it'd be very difficult for politicians to you know, raise two fingers to the voters, which is what they would be doing if they were to vote down a resolution. If it comes, however, to legislation that actually an act of parliament, a bill is required to initiate channel, um, uh, Article 50, I think we're then in a more difficult position because then there will be a huge temptation on the part of members uh, who will salve their conscience with respect to obeying the diktat of the voter by voting for it at second reading, unopposed at second reading, uh, but then moving all sorts of amendments that will take a great deal of time 
and derail the whole process. And indeed, the leader of the Liberal Democrat, Democrat well, the former leader of the Liberal Democrats, Nick Clegg, has announced that that will be the Liberal Democrat strategy. So there we will be in a very difficult set of circumstances to which the obvious remedy to settle the matter would be an election. But you know, you see all sorts of speculation in the press about the Prime Minister calling an election. It is no longer in her gift. That changed in 2010 with the Fixed Term Parliament Act. Parliament would have to repeal that act, or it would have to vote for its own dissolution. The Commons would have to vote for its own dissolution by a majority of two-thirds, or the government would have to lose a confidence vote. And one of these amendments might be one such vote. Um, uh, and there'd be no prospect of forming a new administration that could command the um, confidence of the Commons within a couple of weeks. Uh, so so you're, it's awful messy business. So let's, my view is, uh, I hope the government win the appeal. Mm. Well, that's excellent. Sir Desmond Swain, thank you very much for joining okay. us.